It's a true pleasure to have you here with us, Enrique. Few Latin Americans have had uh, the multilateral experience that uh, Enrique Iglesias has had. He was the foreign minister of Uruguay uh, at a young age, and he has held positions that have uh, placed him at the center and the fore of Latin America's effort to work collectively to uh, act multi multilaterally. For many years, he was uh, known as Mr. Latin America, the person who symbolized the face of a united Latin America. He has represented Latin America in all the most important fora in the world. This is an invaluable experience that we're having here today to speak with him at a time in which Latin America has the largest number of internet of uh, inter-American uh, organizations in its history. We've had a proliferation of all types of organizations, uh, acronyms, and the names uh, is quite confusing. UNISOR, MERCOSUR, uh, with uh, ec um, uh, CELA. Do you remember that one? Yes, it still exists. And so there's this uh, proliferation of zombie organizations. Now, zombie is someone that looks uh, alive but's actually dead. Now, the OES, for example, is a good example of a, a zombie organization. It's got a building, it's got a Secretary General, people go there to work, and uh, the elevators go up and down. It's got a web page, it has its meetings and so forth, but it, nothing happens there. It's dead. And this is an extreme example. Perhaps uh, that's partially unfair because there are parts of the OAS that still uh, show some signs of life, but generally speaking, uh, this is the context we find ourselves in. So this introduction. I think might have made uh, Enrique Iglesias uh, feel a bit uncomfortable given how diplomatic he usually is. But that's my introduction, not his. So to start, Enrique, this is a context in which we find ourselves in a world of turmoil, in which rules are being changed on us uh, from one moment to the next. And, uh, and organizations, long-standing organiza organizations that become zombies, or zombie ones or transitory ones become permanent ones, and a week doesn't go by that we're not uh, caught off guard or surprised by some news item. So my question is, where does the bank stand in all this? Let's start with uh, your overview of where Latin America fits into the world in this turbulent, tumultuous world in which uh, we go from the immigrant crisis in Europe to the uh, uh, Islamic State uh, and the slowdown of China, China's economy. Where does Latin America fit into all of this? Well, I'm truly pleased to be with you here at this meeting, at this encounter, all very interesting. I think uh, the dialogue, CAF, the OES, for this, this is one of the high points in our dialogue on Latin America and the Caribbean at this forum. So again, I thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with you as well. He makes some uh, pretty uh, thorny comments. For someone who's been in international organizations for some 50 years, I can't agree with everything he said. I'm going to try to smooth over and uh, soften up a little bit of what he said. But he does have some points to make that are worthwhile. But I do think that you've said something that we do need to accept, that the world is going through a very uh, deep change. It's not a, a change of epic, it's an epic of change. I think the crisis of 2008 was a watershed event uh, that wrapped up a 30-year period of time in which we thought we'd found solutions for everything, that uh, we thought we'd be able to overcome any problem that arose, and that's over. That's behind us. There is no foreseeability now, predictability that we thought we had, or we can no longer feel so secure. We have come into a period of insecurity. Now, there are many factors. We all know what they are. But now we all are experiencing the crisis of the Middle East, what's happening in China, the US, 
globalization uh, has uh, committed all of us. Another thing uh, that uh, involves all of us is technology, which uh, changes at a breakneck speed, uh, how we think, how we communicate with one another. And uh, this is certainly a lot of uh, tumult, turmoil, as well as economic uh, changes that are profound. The trans we're, we're seeing the, uh, the, the largest uh, historic transfer of economic power from the West to the East. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. And so we need to be prepared for a period of insecurity, of uh, lack of predictability, and of surprises that we receive every day. The geopolitical factors, some of which you mentioned, The, the migratory issue that we see, uh, uh, Russia with uh, Europe, the Chinese uh, Sea. And so what is Latin America doing within this context? That's the question. And so, well, first, uh, we're feeling the impact of what's happening in the world, starting with the economic ones. We had our Gilded Age in which some spoke of a change of uh, time or that the promised land had finally arrived. And we, we actually see that that period is over. So what's happening in China is influencing us. What's happening in the US economy, if interest rates are going to be uh, raised or not. Uh, and so I think the uh, responses within this context, uh, where is Latin America? Well, the first thing we should say is that it's in a, a region in peace. The system of international organizations, we must admit, helped make that possible. We do have conflicts, uh, border conflicts, but it's a continent that, generally speaking, is in peace. Now, something else that's very important is that this is a continent that has done many things. We bring poverty from uh, 45 to 28 percent. That's no, uh, nothing to sneeze at. So much has been done. And I think it's very important, especially for many people, to, Democracy is uh, something that young people take for granted, but uh, in my generation, it's something we had to fight for. And so let's, let's uh, not be uh, over frightened by what we're talking about right now and get uh, and exaggerate the scenario. Now, I, I think the first thing we have to do is be aware of the fact that we have to prepare ourselves for this uh, world of uncertainty, and in so doing, unity in Latin America needs is something we need to place uh, more importance on, a greater premium on than ever in the past, and not just in theory. This region that has had a proliferation of economic and political institutions that's been quite vigorous has not quite yet grasped the fact that it's going to uh, have a lot of power. We have seven trillion dollars of uh, product that the private sector is taking uh, advantage of. Um, this is a demonstration of the fact that integration is possible, and it's done through these institutions with all of its uh, blemishes and imperfections. And so I would say that right now, the first thing we need to uh, realize is Latin America has to be fully aware that its first reaction has to be to seriously get the system up and running. Now, for us to defend ourselves in this world of insecurity, we have to strengthen what we have already. And this uh, falls to Latin America, especially to the large countries. Uh, I'll let you ask the next question so I don't eat up all your time. It's true that Latin America is at peace. When you make that assertion, you're referring to the fact that uh, the countries of Latin America are at peace with each other, despite uh, what border conflicts may exist. But Latin America isn't 
at peace within countries, but among countries, but not within countries. Within countries, there's a, uh, there are demonstrations, uh, blockades of uh, streets, uh, presidents being uh, ousted and corruption scandals that uh, take people to the streets. There's a murder rate in Latin America that's the highest in the world. Latin America has 8% of the world's population and 31% of the world's murders. Latin America uh, peacefully uh, coexists with murder, which uh, really makes it hard for us to assert that Latin America is at peace. It is, as you say, at peace internationally, but within countries' borders, it isn't. These are fragmented countries, polarized countries, and countries that have such high levels of differences can't operate effectively internationally, and that itself leads to greater fragmentation within Latin America, which is what makes it difficult for it to act collectively, the common front. So in your experience, this fragmentation, this uh, uh, level of uh, polarization of a conflict, of uh, groups pitted against each other, is there precedent for this? Have you? Uh, well, you've been in, in, in on the stage uh, for on the por uh, international stage for many years. Have you seen this level of conflict or fragmentation, pug uh, pugnaciousness? Uh, let's say. Well, certainly insecurity is a huge problem in the region, and it is rooted in many things: in drug trafficking, and especially in organized crime. These are two very serious things, and without a doubt, this is one of the big challenges in which international cooperation among countries is important, key, and where it's also very important, as I see it, for there to be cooperation between the law enforcement and civil society. These are two expressions that uh, might not seem akin, but those countries that have made the most progress have cooperation between the political power, forces of security or law enforcement, and civil society. And that's something we're having a hard time building. I don't want to say that we're talking about a heaven on earth in Latin America. We have to acknowledge these issues. But we have the economic side as well. We have gone from the golden period in which we have brought down poverty. Middle class has uh, grown. More investments have happened. More entrepreneurs emerged. And this gave rise to uh, frustration vis-a-vis -vis the economic slowdown and so forth, uh, uh, the bust and the what was the boom of uh, commodity sales and so forth. And this is something we see within each and every one of our countries. We have to uh, adjust, adopt to these changes and find the way to uh, manage the problem that comes from abroad, the uh, reduction in the purchase of our raw materials, which has come to stay. There are countries in Central America, for example, in which the uh, terms of uh, trade are very positive, as uh, Mr. Ocampo was saying. But generally speaking, Latin America, or well, that period is uh, behind us. And that gave rise to there being a need for domestic uh, agreement uh, to now uh, move into this period of frugality that we have to face. And now uh, people are demanding quality services. Taking the people to take them to the streets. Uh, uh, our, our big uh, issue of the day uh, years back was uh, more money for universities and better quality education. And uh, this is a different world we find ourselves in right now. But the current issue is in seeing how we can carry out this transition to avail ourselves of this time in which we have to be uh, frugal in our expenditures, administer more uh, effectively our money, and uh, to make uh, those investments we have to make. We have many issues uh, in which we have started certain things, but we haven't finished them. Education, productivity, reforming the state, overhauling the state. We know what needs to be done. It's a matter of how to do it and how to pay for it. 
there's a consensus among experts uh, that the next couple of years are going to be more difficult, uh, economically speaking, for Latin America than the years right after the 2008 crisis, and that Latin America weathered that storm, that crisis quite well, was one of the regions uh, in which uh, one of the, the largest uh, economic ca catastrophes of the world uh, was something that Latin America uh, sailed through quite well and uh, where Europe was hard hit. And now everyone agrees that Latin America is going to uh, be harder hit by the aftermath. Now there's a sensation among uh, that Latin Americans aren't fully aware of what's going to hit them, what's coming. And uh, they have high expectations based on how things, uh, how well things have gone. In the last couple of years, they think it's going to continue. They've uh, made progress, and now they have a right, uh, acquired rights, uh, to the progress they've achieved, which they see as the result of their own effort. This is what uh, the Latino Barometro uh, says in its surveys. People do have a better quality of life in Latin America, and that is re owing to the fact that they have higher levels of income and that that is a result of their own effort, their own hard work, and not necessarily uh, the growth or the prices of commodities and so forth, which, of course, is going to change. And something else that's very interesting from the surveys of Latino Barometro is that uh, given the main concerns of Latin Americans, well, before, rather, it was uh, losing one's job. Now the biggest concern Certainly, uh, jobs have become more stable, and the main concern right now is the quality of public services that you've just referred to, especially the quality of, well, security and urban transportation. Urban transportation, being able to get to your job, which is a nightmare in most places in Latin America. So within this context of high expectations, there's a, a hard uh, belt tightening adjustment uh, coming down the pike for Latin America right now. And this uh, just enhances or exacerbates conflict. It's hard to undertake uh, profound economic reforms, a belt tightening, without this uh, having uh, repercussions in uh, the political uh, and social scenario. There's conflict that results from that. And countries need to organize themselves to uh, tackle this change in a united way. How do you, uh, how do we uh, handle this contradiction between social demands uh, that are rising and uh, the political response to it? It's not the first time we have adjustment problems, but we have been able to handle them better in other times than in other times. We have greater accumulated reserves. And what's more, we have made already some major reforms in the economy, especially the question of reforms is something that truly helps us to put up with the reform process. We've ha we're having that problem in Uruguay where we're in an adjustment process, which means that we have to be somewhat frugal in our expenditures. But it is difficult to control expectations, of course. And I would say two things. First, I think we have to explain people what, to people what is happening. I think people are more intelligent than what political sectors normally believe. People understand certain things. And the first thing is to explain things to them. And second, to call for a number, for a certain consensus in society. Here we spoke about the possibility of agreeing on certain things. But when we see what is happening in the world, when we see what is happening in key sectors, such as prices of raw materials, I think that there's a basis there for political parties to find or reach certain agreements, beginning by holding a dialogue with people, explaining to people why some things cannot continue and why we cannot meet all expectations that people have had and that have accumulated. I think that is feasible. But at the same time, within that context, to be able to do things in Latin America should be an alternative by putting things together. And by that, I mean not only how to do things together in integration. First of all, we are in Latin America very not very critical of ourselves in our systems and our relations. I listen to you, yes, but that's about it. I think we have to be a little 
more self-critical, more critical about ourselves, especially with regard to integration, cooperation for integration. But at the same time, we have to reach for fields of agreement. In Latin America, Latin America is a perfect place for investment by capitals in infrastructure, for instance. PPPs, private-public partnerships, have been very successful, for instance, in Chile and also somewhat in Brazil. But we've learned to negotiate with the private sector, and that is very important. In addition, I think, well, one of the things that worries me now is the following. I worked a lot in the international arena with the Uruguay Round and that great dream that we had for multilateral trade that now is being questioned. I think that the world is going more towards fragmentation than towards free and open international trade. Little can Latin America do to prevent this. These are things that arise from other countries. But in general terms, if you look at the map, you see this great dream that we had of a world trade organization that began in Punta del Este in 86. Well, I think that's in crisis. I think we're going towards something very different. The world will begin negotiating by blocks and not at the table of multilateral organizations. That's my impression. If that is the case, what do we do? Well, some things are being done already, starting with the countries of the Pacific. They are beginning with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There are 11 Latin American countries that have relationship with the United States and with the European Union. The North Atlantic is also organizing. So isn't it time now to negotiate with the United States on a formal agreement of cooperation? In other words, uh, for trade, for cooperation in human resources and technology? One of the major obstacles that existed, the dialogue between Cuba and the United States is over. That used to be an obstacle, but not anymore. So isn't it time now to ensure that this continent can truly have a structural relationship in a number of areas with the United States and with Canada? Why is everyone organizing on the basis of these initiatives, and why don't we have a sensible and reasonable vision when in our hemisphere we have the most important country in the world? We discussed this here in Washington when I was at the IDB with the creation of ALCA that later was over. But now that the doors are open in relations that had always been an obstacle to dialogue between the United States and Latin America, that is that now that there is an open relationship between, or that there's beginning to be an open relationship between Cuba and the United States, isn't it time to realize that in this very difficult world, we can have agreements like the Pacific, or almost all the Pacific has agreements with the United States. So I think that that is something that we should think about. How come we cannot have something comprehensive with the United States, it's, that is, between the United States and Latin America, to confront the uncertainties that we see today? In this area that you just mentioned, which is something new, by the way, what you've just mentioned is not part today of the dialogue in Latin America, the idea of reactivating a free trade initiative of trade agreements with the United States. And I agree with you. I think that would be desirable. It would be advisable. But no one speaks about that. And for the reason that you mentioned, that the largest country of Latin America, Brazil, is not part of that discussion. Marco Delio Garcia, one of Dilma Rousseff's major advisors who was here has explicitly stated that, and he's been on the record saying that that is not a free trade agreement with the United States, that that is not a priority for Brazil, nor should it be a priority for Latin America. That's what he said. Dilma Rousseff herself has shown very lukewarm enthusiasm for that. And when the Pacific Alliance came about, both Dilma Rousseff and President Lula, as well as Minister Patriot and Marco Aurelio Garcia, very loudly denounced the Pacific Alliance, saying it was a neoliberal model of giving things over to the United States 
one of them actually said that that alliance partnership was only marketing, was only something having to do with marketing. So when you have a country with a government that clearly and publicly is so hostile to that idea, how can we expect an idea such as the one you mentioned, how can we expect it to make progress? Well, all opinions are respectable. No, not all of them are. I don't agree. Well, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. I do, well, that opinion can be respected too. There are certain arguments in favor, but when I hear about certain sectors of private opinion in countries such as Brazil, there are people there that are very willing to enter into a dialogue. So this opinion is not shared by everyone. Every country has to define the relationship. Even with the Pacific, the proposal by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chile of diversity is something that is a prevailing thought and their consultation with the Pacific to realize, because the worst that can happen, Moises, is that the fragmentation of international trade will end up fragmenting and fracturing also the United States, uh, Latin America, I mean. We have a fractured economy because the world is becoming fractured. So now we have to come together. And in that union, we have to deal with China. Why shouldn't we have a treaty with China It's uh, or with Europe, where 11 countries already have treaties? Why can't we have a comprehensive treaty with the United States? I don't understand why not, especially when certain obstacles are being removed, those that had created an anti-American spirit, but that's going to be diminishing, and that's going to be one of the important things that will be opening or that could open relationships. And that includes the one between the United States and Cuba. Of course, there's more than one opinion, but the whole world is changing, and we have to change with the world. We'll have to make sure that we change to one thing that is changing both in the world and in Latin America is that there's a new lack of tolerance against corruption. Corruption has always existed. It's always been part of our discussion and denouncements and claims against corruption are part of our daily life. But even after these uh, claims come, no one does anything. And I mentioned this, this aspect of corruption because these adjustments, this change, this new economic and difficult situation, you say that the way to manage this social conflict or social effervescence is that governors or people, authorities explain to people why they have to make their, tighten their belt. But these people who are considered to be corrupt, they're accused of corruption. They're seen as people who are ask, well, they're asking me to make an adjustment and I am poor. In the meantime, he is stealing what should be mine. So the subject of corruption, well, there are 10 countries in Latin America right now where corruption is out in the street. That is, the people are out in the street denouncing corruption. A short time ago, the subject led to the res resignation of the president of Guatemala in Brazil. We have in prison the head of the Brecht, the head of President Lula's cabinet. There is a corruption scandal, a major corruption scandal. In other words, the same goes in, the si same thing is happening in Chile to everyone's surprise. So in this context, do you believe that this is more of the same and that it's simply a temporary effervescence in Alka-Seltzer that leads to effervescence and then that subject will disappear? Or do you think there's been a real in-depth change in the lack of acceptance by people of corruption? Well, yesterday something was said about this subject. The first thing is we don't have the monopoly on corruption. Let's start with that. Latin America does not have the monop monopoly on corruption. Let's see what's happening in Asia. Yes, but to a young Brazilian who is in the street protesting to say, look, in Asia there's corruption in Indonesia too. No, no, let me answer first your question. Wait, 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 wait. I just wanted to say the following. I've seen corruption in Asia and Europe. Can you imagine? There's quite a bit. But I've never seen people there in the street going to 
fight against corruption as I've seen it in Latin America. And that's very healthy. That's very good. Someone said yesterday that the question is not that the president of Guatemala left. The problem would have been if he had not left. That would have been serious. For me, the fact that the, that society is reacting on something that is terrible, corruption depresses activity and makes people accept things less, the fact that people are going to the street is very important. And the fact that justice is involved is even more important. Justice is acting. And that shows that there's a separation amongst the branches. And if the region before this disease can react in the streets and through justice means that not everything is bad, things that will happen in the future will be better. The society that will come up from this Latin America improved by people in the street, for instance, that is something that has to be emphasized. Is it bad? Yes, it's terrible. But let us not forget that. I've seen protests, for instance. Well, one of the presidents uh, made the subject of corruption something very important. What I'm trying to say is that in Latin America, of a middle class, there are people who go out to, com to protest, to demonstrate, and they're mobilizing justice, and there are people who are being punished because of corruption. That's good. What will come out of that? A society that is better, not worse. So yes, we're going through this problem, but I don't lose hope. I think this is very positive. A close subject that also requires multilateral approach has to do with human rights, with politics, with elections, and the final analysis with democracy. That's an area where Latin America, its ability to act collectively is really terrible. In the last few years, we've seen incredible examples of peaceful coexistence with unacceptable situations where no country has said anything. Speak to us about that. How do you see it? Well, I would say, first of all, regarding that subject, we have a Human Rights Commission at the OAS, by the way, that no other region has, which answers to what you said at the beginning. There are institutions in this region that in the economic and in human rights fields. Well, there's no other region that I know that has a Lima Declaration on Democracy, for instance. Now that you say that these rights have been violated, that is truly unfortunate and has to be corrected. But this region has rec recognized, as no other has, things that are truly unimaginable in other regions, such as the Human Rights Convention, the Inter-American Human Rights Convention, the Convention on Democracy at the OAS. So let us not say or be so critical. There are instruments that have been created and that don't exist in other places, but they don't work. Yes, I agree. But at least we have a critical awareness that people have to be they have to take into account and it's a way of approaching the subject that they might not be implemented. That's true, but there are people out in the streets that want to have these instruments and want to use them. We don't want to see, of course, a violation of human rights and a freedom of the press in any country. I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that let us not lose hope, because this continent is aware of these objectives, which other countries are not aware of. So what to do with that? Well, to continue supporting fundamental rights. The press, for instance, has played a major role in this area in the defense or in criticizing certain violations of human rights. Enrique, don't you think that in Latin America in the last few years there's been a kind of authoritarian approach in the last few years? There's been a greater restriction of the freedom of the press. People or businessmen buy mass media that eventually become puppets of the government. We've seen a number of circumstances and situations that truly make countries appear to be democratic and they're not. Well, I can't say that that isn't true. That is unfortunately. So do you think that there is an authoritarian approach now in Latin America? Well, there are authoritarian experiments. 
but there's still institutions that criticize this, that denounce this. I've seen cases in which this does not happen, other regions in which there no one can even say next door, in the country next door, what is happening. We have press institutions and others that are operating. Of course, these are serious failings, but I don't lose hope because I try to compare with what is happening in other countries. Well, now that we're speaking about desirable but unfeasible proposals such as exploring the possibility of having trade agreements with the United States, trade and investment agreements, well, economic agreements with the United States, I think that is not necessarily feasible, although you mention it, and I think it is something that should be discussed. In this idea of being innovative in Latin America, given possibilities as well as restrictions, don't you think we could set up a kind of coalition of the decent? I'm talking about the coalition of decent countries. Countries I'm trying let me explain. I'm thinking about countries that are willing to sacrifice their trade and political interests to benefit certain fundamental principles. Countries that are willing to tell other countries, you cannot imprison leaders of the opposition just because they are, they are opposition leaders. You simply cannot. But in order to do that, we need leadership. And you know all the actors. You are well acquainted with all of the presidents. You know all the Latin American presidents. Do you think they're too distracted with their domestic problems they all have, domestic priorities, domestic interests? Countries don't necessarily have friends. They always and only have interests. But countries also have principles and values. Don't you think that there's a space in Latin America for some presidents to begin feeling embarrassed about the fact that continuously they're putting their own short-term political interests before fundamental principles of democracy, freedom of expression, of not torturing, of not imprisoning? Is there space for that? And if so, who could take avail themselves of that opportunity? Well, first of all, the presidents who could take the initiative of speaking to other presidents. Which ones? Who? Who? No, 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 no. You're not going to ask me to give a name. No, no, no. Uh, 64 years after having done everything we have done. No, not at all. We all know who they could be and who they would not be. So why should we give their names out? I think that, yes, what you were saying more seriously now is that you're right. I think it is possible and it is advisable. There are institutions who could support this. There have been cases. I wouldn't say, well, there have been certain examples where there has been intervention, when there were problems in Bolivia where the presidents intervened, in, to a certain extent in Paraguay too. So to a certain extent, there have been examples. Now, I think that that could expand. Of course, leaders will have to be willing to face these, to work on these principles. But that's why institutions exist, too. You said something at the beginning. One thing is the institution or governments who are part of the institutions. If the countries don't want to, nothing will come out of the institution. And the other thing is the initiative we can do through dialogue, conversation, discussion, and presence in the mass media and in the institutions itself. I do believe that Latin America has shown that it's the region in the developing world that has the most number of institutions of political and economic cooperation. There's no other continent with so much. In the financial area, we have the IDB, CAF, regional banks, in addition to international banks, like the, well, the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera. All this exists. In human rights, we have the OAS institutions. By the way, we're speaking about a continent 
that has had institutions since the end of the 19th century. In the region, there is an institutional fabric, and this fabric works at the behest of the countries. True, countries can paralyze the vision of a secretariat, even if it wants to take action. Is there power in the secretariat? Yes, they can denounce, they can give information. All of this plays an important role. But this does not replace the fact that there could be presidents that could take an active initiative. That would be something we would, of course, all welcome. Another possibility, Enrique, is to see if we can truly revitalize or give more energy to organizations, to existing organizations, but that are somewhat dead or don't quite operate. I will not speak about one of the sponsors of this organization, which is the OES. So I don't agree with that opinion, by the way, just let you know, letting you know. What are the possibilities, given your experience, Enrique, if Mr. the Secretary General of the OES, Mr. Almagro, says, give me some advice, what should I do? I have become the Secretary General of a bankrupt organization. Bank Bankruptcy in legitimacy, in reputation, in finances, in abilities, in capacity, in everything. This organization, though, certain of its elements are critical. If they didn't exist, they would have to be created. So I am very much in favor of an OES that will work for the objectives for which it was designed. So if he asks for your advice and he says, tell me two or three things that I should do to revitalize this dying organization. What would I say? What would I say to him, to Mr. Almagro? Well, I would say that he should do what he did yesterday. What I mean is that yesterday he said that he will continue doing what he thinks the secretariat should do, regardless of any other considerations. And he gave a, he showed passion in what he said. That's the first element you need to have. In these positions, you have to be in love with your position so that you can really convey something to others. And he conveyed that yesterday. He's only been there for 100 days. But when you go into these institutions, you have to see how difficult it is to work with governments who have their own spokespeople and their own interest to do things is not easy. To be committed to the principles of the organization and to do what he did as he did to go to the border between Colombia and Venezuela is something that can be done by the secretary. But let us not ask him to go beyond that, because the governments are the ones who vote in the security in the permanent council at the OAS. So a secretary committed to principles and honest with everyone, that is what truly allows the organization to have influence. But in the other, in the final analysis, it's governments who decide. As you can see, Enrique Iglesias has the well-deserved reputation and recognition as a leader in Latin America who understands the region and who truly understands our limitations, but can also dream and imagine possibilities that for the time being are not before us, but could be before us. Please let us thank him with a big applause.